Let's take our Bibles, and if we're able, let's stand and turn to 1 Kings chapter 3 tonight. 1 Kings chapter number 3. I did um, have a couple ask about the sign-up sheets with the Memorial Day. forgot to mention this to Brother Knox earlier. I know that the sides say things like um, salads and stuff, but obviously with tacos, the, the idea is just a good side that would go with tacos, okay? So, so we give, we're giving you, you've got liberty there, all right? So don't feel like you've got to be tied into something that would go well with a burger when we're not having a burger, okay? So just, you've got, you've got wiggle room, all right? So as the Lord leads, as the Lord leads, and I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be, I'm sure we'll be just fine uh, with that. First Kings chapter 3. A scripture that the Lord really spoke to me about, I didn't see, just, I kind of out of nowhere. Don't you love when the Word of God does that, just kind of comes and grabs you? And this verse and the truth behind this verse uh, really arrested my attention. I hope I'll be able to articulate it uh, to us tonight. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says this, And Solomon awoke... And behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and, off, uh, and, offered, up, and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. I want to preach on this subject with the Lord's help. The demeanor of faith. The demeanor of of faith. Let's pray. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. I pray that you would help us to consider this great example uh, from Solomon this night. Bless the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Solomon, in our last message in this text, was concerned about his lack of experience in judging God's people. He, he understood that he had been chosen by God, he had been anointed by God. His words were he was the servant of God to stand before this great people that cannot even be numbered. And he was to lead them, he was to guide them, he was to judge them. And as he saw this people, that was God's people, knowing the great purpose and plan that God had for them, he was, he was, he was concerned, he was burdened down with the reality that he was like a little child when it came to the experience of shepherding a people. He had never been a general, he had never been a captain, he had never, as his father had led in many other situations long before he had ever become the king, Solomon did not have that kind of resume, and so he was very concerned, and he was very, uh, uh, I don't want to necessarily use the word afraid because he doesn't say that, but no doubt was leaning heavily in that realm of strong concern and wondering how he was supposed to do the job that God had called him to. And so God comes to him in a dream, and God comforts him, and, and essentially the way that God does it is he knows how, how passionate that Solomon is about this. And so he comes to Solomon and says in this dream, whatever you desire, whatever you want, ask it of me. And so Solomon asks for an understanding heart. And God responds with, with, with he's greatly pleased at the fact that Solomon didn't ask long life. He didn't ask for the destruction of his enemies. He didn't ask for excessive wealth. He asked that God would give him an understanding heart to be able to properly judge God's people. And so God said, not only will I give you an understanding heart, but I will give you the wisdom, I will give you wisdom like none has ever had before you or none will ever come after you. In addition, I'm going to go ahead and give you all the stuff that you could have asked for that you didn't ask for. And so, so God promises his blessing, God promises his wisdom to equip or enable Solomon to deal with the task laid before him. And so then you come to verse 15 and it says, and Solomon awoke and behold, it was a dream. Solomon wakes up. You, you can imagine after this 
this kind of a dream, this kind of interaction with the Lord. He, he's trying to kind of figure out where he's at. He's trying to collect himself. And then as he's there in his bed, as he's there in his room, he realizes it was a dream. This didn't really happen. This could almost be deflating for him. I mean, having had this dream with God, then to wake up and realize it was a dream. But, but as he begins to kind of work through the idea of this dream, he, there is an impression that he feels of God that what he has experienced is not just a dream. In other words, this was not a man conjured up vision. This was not something that he created, but that the Lord truly had met him. That God truly had come to him in this dream. And so he realized, no doubt, I mean, because God would have the capacity of making that known to someone, that this wasn't just something that he was hoping for or wishing for expressed in a vision. This was God coming to him, promising to give him an understanding heart, and he believed that God was going to do exactly what he said. Now, and it wouldn't take very long, and Solomon's going to have a chance to really see how real this really was or was not. Because you come to the very next verse, and the Bible says this, And there came two women that were harlots unto the king that should be before him. It would just be about another day, and you know where Solomon's going to be? He's going to be sitting in the judgment seat. And the doors are going to open, and now lines of people are going to come in, and he's going to have elders, and he's going to have citizens, and he's going to have captains, and he's going to have disputes, and he's going to have troubles that are going to come to him looking for him to make decisions and judgments concerning what is brought for him. Verse 16 states that one of the situations that first day is going to be two, har two harlots coming to him, each one having had a child, but one of those children having died, each one laying claim that the one baby that is alive is theirs without any doctors, without any witnesses, without any proof of whose living child it is. And Solomon only gets to sit there and discern what to do with that baby and those two women fighting over that child's life. I'm just saying that here very shortly, here in just a 24 to 48 hour stint, Solomon's going to know without a shadow of a doubt whether or not God's given him wisdom or not. Because it's not going to take long after dealing with a dispute here or a dispute there that Solomon is going to know within himself whether he's faking it or not. Solomon's going to know inside whether he's got the wisdom that God promised him. When you've got more wisdom than anyone else on the planet, you're probably going to know that you had an increase in wisdom at that time. And so that's just around the corner. So then look again at verse 15. It says, okay, now remember in verse 5 where Solomon is. He's in Gibeon. He's outside of Jerusalem. He's in the city uh, of the Benjamites. And that is where he was offering at the high place. And he has his dream there. And then verse 15 says, And Solomon awake, and behold, it was a dream, and he came to Jerusalem. So Solomon is in Gibeon. He wakes up. He, he realizes that this was a dream, but yet it wasn't, just, it wasn't a normal dream. God had revealed himself. God indeed had spoken to him. And so he packs up his bags. He gathers up his servants. He gathers his belongings. And he makes his way back to Jerusalem. And, and Solomon would go home that night and prepare for the next day, or he would get home that afternoon. Regardless, it would just be around the next day that Solomon would begin doing his job as a judge over God's people. And one might wonder this, and, and I think this is a good question to ask. What is going on in Solomon's mind before he sits on that judgment seat, what, what is his demeanor? What is his disposition? What is the tenor of his emotions? What is the tenor of his spirit after having that dream and then preparing to launch into something, get this, that he knows he's inexperienced for, that he feels completely inadequate to do? Well... Let's just start with this, all the things he could have been. 
There could have no doubt for a man like Solomon, he could have been in a a state if he was a normal person like you and me, he could have been doubting, wondering, you know, at first he's all excited, but as he begins to journey from Gibeon back to Jerusalem, he begins to wonder, man, did I really hear from God? I mean, was that, was that really God or was it a dream? I don't really know. I'm not really sure. Is this true? Is this not true? He could be fretting. What if, what if I'm wrong? What, what if God didn't give me that wisdom and then I'm going to show up and I'm going to be sitting there and, and, and I'm going to think maybe God's giving me wisdom and I'm going to think I'm making the right decision. I'm going to say it with authority and confidence, but what if it doesn't work? And, and what, what if a few sessions in I begin to blow it here and I begin to blow it there and the elders and maybe some of those who don't like me begin to see me make mistakes and man, this could really begin to go downhill really fast. You could see him pleading, going before God saying, God, please give me this wisdom. God, I beg you, please help me, enable me, give me the wisdom that I need. You could see him go home and begin studying, calling in uh, uh, those with the law, the, the, the scribes and the lawyers, and begin to explain to him various laws and truths and, and explain to him certain judgments in the past and, what, and talking to advisors. What are common instances that have come in the past and and what are some things that my father did and and what are some of the more troubling uh, instances that we have in the court and you could you could picture him you know studying and prepping and pouring over old judgments of his father and getting insight from counsel and preparing him for the big day that's coming around you can see him arguing as the as the stress level snapping at his servants, snapping at his counselors as he's beginning to feel overwhelmed by this job that he's thinking to himself, why did God call me to do this? Why would God ask me to do this? I shouldn't be doing this. I'm like a little child. You could see him having some emotional strain and beginning to be frustrated and lashing out at others because he feels ill-equipped for what has been given to him. Or you could see him minimizing the damage, thinking, okay, well, if it begins to go south, I'm going to say I've got a fever and I'm going to dismiss myself and I'm going to collect myself and dismiss myself and try to figure out what to do in the future in order to handle future days and judges. I'm just saying this, that from your experience and mine, there's a lot of things that Solomon could be the night before he's going to sit at the judgment and for all to see, all of those that are watching the manner of judge that he would be to those people. But Solomon doesn't do any of those things. I want you to notice what Solomon does. In verse 15, the Bible says this, And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings. So the first thing that Solomon does is I love this picture. He goes to Jerusalem. He, un, he has his items placed in his room there. But he doesn't go to his advisors. He doesn't go to the study. He doesn't go and try to prepare himself and groom himself. You know where he goes? He goes straight to the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, where he should have went at the very beginning, but God is gracious nonetheless. He goes straight to the Ark of the Covenant. And you know what he does there? He brings an animal to offer unto God. He brings a burnt offering, an offering of praise, an offering of worship. And he spends his time there before God, praising God, worshiping God. But he does more than just offer a burnt offering. The Bible says he offers a peace offering. Now, now a peace offering was often given for a variety of reasons. But one of the most um, common reasons why a peace offering was given was it was an offering that was given in response to God's unexpected or unsought generosity. So oftentimes, when God would do something that was unexpected or unsought, people would offer a peace offering, and that peace offering spoke of fellowship, of, of, a, of a strong bond, a strong relationship. Leviticus 7 says this about the peace offering. I love this picture that they would take this, the grain or they would take the cereal and they would offer that. They would have that and they would also have a, a, um, an animal offering. But in the peace offering, they wouldn't offer the whole thing. They would only offer half of the cereal. They'd only offer half of the animal. And then what they would do is they would eat the other half. And the picture was a fellowship with God. 
the picture was, God, you have been good. God, that's why it was often called a peace offering, because it spoke of restoration. It spoke of fellowship between God and man. Or it spoke of God coming down and doing something good. And so here is Solomon, and he's offered this burnt offering, and he's praising God, and he's worshiping God. And then he takes this cereal, and then he takes the animal, and he offers half, and then he begins to eat the other half, speaking of his fellowship, his closeness, his communion with God, thanking God for the, the, the unexpected generosity of the Lord. That would have taken some time to go to the ark and to offer the burnt offering, and then to go through the whole process uh, of the peace offering. And you would think when that's done, it would be good. Solomon is probably a good idea to now get home, get a good night's rest. You've got a big day tomorrow. You've got to have your mental strength. You've got to have your physical strength. You've got to be absolutely ready when the door is open for you. But that's not where it ends. It says, and made a feast to all his servants. So he offers a burnt offering, worships God. Then he offers a peace offering, and he's eating and fellowshipping with God. And then he says this, I want you to get all of the workers together, and I want you to bring them to the palace, and we're going to open up the spread, and we're going to have a feast tonight, and we're going to celebrate together. And so you got to understand that, first of all, a, a feast, they just got in town. A feast doesn't come in 35 minutes. You don't pop that thing in the microwave. You can't Uber eat that thing. So it's got to be prepared. It's got to be cooked. So we're going well into the night. The food is laid out, and Solomon, as, as the host, isn't just going to leave them and go up by himself. Solomon is rejoicing with them. Solomon is feasting with them. Solomon is celebrating with them. So you've got to see this picture as as this entire day leading up to the big day, Solomon's offering burnt offerings. Solomon's eating peace offerings. Solomon is laughing with his servants and fellowshipping with his servants and enjoying his servants. All the way to the late night where he's going to turn around and wake up for the big day. Sounds like some of our students. Up late night, waking up for the big day in the morning. Solomon's demeanor is pretty clear here, isn't it? He's not rushing around trying to get himself ready. He's not worried. He's worshiping. He's thanking God. He's celebrating with God. He's enjoying God. Eating with his servants. Eating in the presence of God. Laughing and enjoying the goodness of God and the blessings of God and the generosity of God in his life. He's even keeping the boundaries of his life in check, knowing, yes, I have a job to do tomorrow. Yes, I've got to sit on that judgment tomorrow, but that's not tomorrow. Today I'm going to sacrifice. Today I'm going to worship. Today I'm going to be with the servants, and we're going to glory in the goodness of Almighty God. How in the world? Okay, real life. Verse 16, hard stuff coming his way. Solomon knows hard stuff's coming his way. How can Solomon be this way with what's coming, not just with what's coming, but knowing he and himself is inexperienced and not, and not internally prepared for what's coming? Here's why. His demeanor is governed by faith. He has faith. He believes that God is going to do as he said he would do. That dream is God's word to him. That dream is God's promise to him. That dream was very vivid and very clear and impressed upon him that God was going to give him a wisdom unlike any human being outside of Jesus Christ would ever know. That was God's word that he latched onto and as Solomon heard the word of God, listen to me, he latched on with faith. He believed that God was going to do just like he said. And he knew, yes, it's going to be difficult. Yes, it's coming down the way. But God has spoken. God will be with me. And so his celebration, his thanking, his enjoying, it's not built upon being flippant. It's not built upon a lack of, of, of needing to be prepared. It's not him being, um, being lazy. It is him basing his emotions, basing his demeanor, basing his deportment on the word of the living God 
for his circumstance. His behavior is completely governed by the word of God in his life before it actually transpires. You know, we, we go through life and, and we, we come into different kinds of circumstances. And God gives us his word about these things. He, he has many promises for you and me. He has promises for you and me in financial situations. He has promises for you and me in regarding to provide for us. He has promises for us in regarding to trials and tribulations. The word of God through the words of Jesus Christ alone, just Matthew chapter 5 through 7, is full of the promises of God for you and me in all kinds of varying situations in life. And here's what often happens. We... We, we, we come upon, like Solomon, we're at the night before. And we have the promise of God. We have the word of God. We know what God says, but get it, we haven't seen the fulfillment of it yet. We're, we're, we're the day before it's all going to happen. We're in the period of time before the deliverance. And here's what often happens. We have the promise, but we still have the problem. And because we have the problem, we lack confidence in God. We struggle with our faith. And our demeanor tends to be like someone who maybe their first time getting on a roller coaster and, and the shoulder latches go down and they're afraid those latches are going to come back up. You ever been there? I remember there. Remember the first time I got on one of those suckers. That thing comes down and I'm like, are you sure this thing's going to hold? Are you sure? What? And you know what you do? You hold on to it like if it doesn't hold, you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> and you're holding so tight and you're like just, you're just all tight and there's people all around. They're having a good time. You're not having a good time. You're just trying to survive so that you can live another day. You know, it happens to ride ends and you get off. And you know what you feel? You feel wore out and you're relieved that you're alive. You know, that's how a lot of us live our life with God. We have the promise, and we know the promise, and we cling to the promise, but we cling to the promise like we're not sure the promise is actually going to happen, and we hold, and we hold, and we're fretting, and we're doubting, and we're prepping, and we're studying, and we're hurrying, and, and we're, we're snapping at people, and we're going through all this stuff, and we're wearing, and we're wearing, and we're wearing, but then God gets us through. God delivers, but we get to the end, our hair is all disheveled, and our eyes are wide open, and we're like, well, praise God, we got through it. Do you know what the dominant feeling of following God like that is? Relief. <sighs> okay. He did do what he said. Come on. We've all been here. We've all been here. And I got, I, oh yeah, I'm just clinging on by faith. I'm just clinging on by faith. But what if I don't, I'm just going to study. I'm going to work. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna do, I'm just, I'm just going to get through this. And we get through it. God does what he says like he always does. And we are all wore out. We're all tired. We got to go mend relationships because we. I'm so sorry that I was that way for the last three weeks. Whatever it is, but and we just sigh a breath of relief that we got through the roller coaster of the Christian life. But that's not Solomon's approach to his life. We need to do more than just hold on for dear life. We need to approach our life by faith. We need to believe his word. We need to trust his word. We need to take hold of his word. With conflicts, with money, with jobs, with doctor's results. Listen, before it's all worked out. Before. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing. That word careful speaks of anxiousness. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren. See, he, we, we stop there, but he, there's more to it than that. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, 
whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Paul says, listen, before the promise, pray and seek God and trust God and think about His Word and think about what He says and believe in Him and don't, He didn't say, and hold on for dear life. He says, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds. Not exactly quite like this, but somewhat similar. It's like the person, once you've ridden that ride the first couple times and you begin to get confidence in it, and you don't do this anymore, now you're going, Woo! You're like, where's that camera at? I'm going to look that camera right in the face. I'm going to give you the pick. Come on. That's how people live who trust God. Now, I'm not suggesting that in the middle of job uncertainty, you're going to be like, Pastor, woo, praise God. But what I'm saying is there's going to be confidence in him, trust in him, belief in him, celebration in him, worship in him, reliance upon him. People, who's, people who trust God before the deliverance, their dominant emotion is not relief. Catch this. Their dominant emotion is rejoicing. Amen. You find Solomon the night before. What is he doing? He's rejoicing. Did Solomon take his job seriously? Yes, he took it seriously. He took it so seriously that up at night he, he had a choice for anything that he could possibly have. And he asked God to give him an understanding heart. That showed he was sober about the job that God had given him. But he trusted God to such a degree that before God had shown that the wisdom was there, he believed God that the wisdom was there. And so there was a confidence, a rejoicing, a trust, a belief a conviction that allowed him, get this, that allowed him to enjoy his life before God got him out of the pig, the pig mess. Our Christian life can be dictated by relief more than rejoicing too many times. We can spend our life in tension, anger, worry, and then we have momentary lapses of relief where we get to praise God and enjoy God. Where, where we still see God, we're just really wore out in the process. All of us know this. You ever had times where you went through something and, and I mean, you were, you were scared? You were scared. Come on, Abraham was afraid. Moses was afraid. David was afraid. All of these men needed God to come to him at different times and say, fear not. You're afraid. And you, and you love God and you know what God's word says, but it's like, well, what if? And you start working to help God. And you, you do this and you do that and you're wearing all the pressure of the decisions and you're wearing all the weight of things working out, and you're up late, and you're putting this all, and, and you know what you do? You wear yourself out. And then God does it in the way that only he can do it. It had nothing to do with you. He gets you through it, and you think back to yourself, man, I could have handled that so much better. So often, our Christian life looks like stress, stress, anxiety, tension, frustration, relief, Tension, tension, hold on, hold on, relief, rather than rejoicing and praising God. But that is where faith comes in. Now listen to this statement, and we're going to draw some applications. Faith is more about rejoicing in God's promise than it is finding relief after God's deliverance. Let me say it again, I don't know if you got that. Faith is more about rejoicing in God's promise. What does that mean? It means this. I'm rejoicing before anything's happened. I'm confident before anything's transpired. I'm believing before the delivery has gotten there. That's what faith is more of. Then, finding relief after God's deliverance. Man, we got through that one. Boy, I need a nap for about 10 years because I am so wore out. No, praise God that he, de he delivers us. But the life of faith is meant to look much more like rejoicing than it's meant to look like relief. 
Let me, let me give you some thoughts to think about tonight. The Lord really challenged me about this. Your demeanor in uncertain times is a great barometer of your faith. Solomon. Night before he's going to sit down, got a couple harlots with a baby. It's my baby, it's my baby. Any witnesses? No witnesses. Solomon, who gets the baby? But you know what? He was a man of faith. You know how? You see his demeanor? Joy, worship, celebrating of God. Do you want to know where our faith level is? See what our demeanor is when things are uncertain. Can you, can you worship? Can you praise? Can you celebrate? Are you overcome by biblical? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean there's never time of preparation. It doesn't mean you don't put thought. But do you, listen, but, but does your demeanor show someone who really believes God's got this? Number two, we must combat our times of fear with faith in God's word. Now, what you don't need is just positive thinking. That's not going to help you. What you need is you need a promise from here. This is what you need, a promise. I'm going through this situation what is God's promise? That's what you need. And, and when, you're going through, when you're going through trials, when you're going through difficulties, you know what you need? You need to cling on to that promise. And I can't tell you how many times in my Christian life and other Christians' lives, going through a storm, going through a trial, and God just gives a verse. And every time the mental, the mental battle begins to rage, every time the emotional battle begins to rage, just cling to the promise. Cling to the truth and let that truth combat the fear. Let that verse combat the anxiety. Let that verse combat the what ifs and rest strongly upon the word of the living God. One more, this is so important. Now listen carefully. The difference between us and the world should be found in the process, not just the result. Can I say that again? The difference between us and the world should be found in the process, not just the result. In other words, in other words, people shouldn't just see God in our life at the end when he gets us through the storm. People should see God in our life when we're in the storm. People should be able to see a strength, a joy, a contentment, a peace, a confidence. And I'm not talking about, you know, just being, being fake. I'm talking about a real, a real faith in God that separates us from the world out there. Our life should, listen to me, when you're going through a hard time and the world is going through a hard time, we shouldn't look the same. We shouldn't look the same. No, no, we're, we're, there's a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching and a lot of concentration that's making us as believers need the same things, act the same way as someone who's in a difficulty that doesn't have the word of God, doesn't have the Holy Spirit, doesn't have the shepherd, doesn't have the new man. No, what they look like in a trial should not be the same as what we look like in a trial. And the difference should be observable, not just in the fact, man, God got me out of this. The difference should be, God was with me in the fire. People should be able to see the difference in you at a hard day of work. When things are unsettled in the, in the, in the company, when things are a little topsy-turvy in the economy, when you're going through financial strain, and more than likely, you are to some capacity right now, people should be able to discern a difference in you than the way the world acts, the world talks, and the way the emotional balance of this world should be different than the emotional life that you and I have. Why? Because we have the promises of God. And we have the Spirit of God that should enable us to look different, live different, and act different. You, you should ask yourself, when, I, when there's a hard thing going on at work, do, do my words sound just like my coworker who doesn't know Jesus Christ? 
when, when I'm going through some uncertain times, do I complain, gossip, murmur, get down, get negative, just like the world, or is there something different about me? See, the difference should not just be found in the end. God's going to take care of you, even if we don't handle it right. God's going to be with us, but we, people need to see God while we're going through the trial. Watch that guy on the roller coaster holding on. There's nothing about that that makes me say, I want what you got. The confidence and the knowledge of God is what is a light to a dark world. So here's Solomon. He has the dream in Gibeon. God says, I'm going to give you wisdom. He makes his way back to Jerusalem. The very next day, he's going to deal with all of these questions and all of these issues. And so here he is. He's got one day before he faces all that. And he could have been studying. He could have been fretting. He could have been doing all this stuff. But what's he doing? He's worshiping. He's celebrating. He's gathering his servants. Why? Because his faith in God gave him a demeanor of rejoicing. And by the way, when he gets up, that next day we're going to see, God did show up. And God gave him a wisdom that we marvel on to this day. And the challenge for you and me is so simple tonight. That faith is more about rejoicing in God's promise than finding relief after God's deliverance. I pray that God would give us a demeanor of faith that celebrates, rejoices, has confidence before he delivers. May our demeanor be typified by rejoicing, not just relief. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Such a simple text, but what a challenge. I pray, dear God, that, that in times of uncertainty, people would see us at the ark. At times of uncertainty, we could still get around our family and we could still laugh. That at times of uncertainty, we, we wouldn't be prickly and, and hard to be around. But while we might be struggling, we have this peace and we have this confidence from you that allows us, God, to show the fruit of the Spirit. We thank you for every time you've delivered us. We thank you for every time we've found relief in spite of us. But God, we seek a higher plane than relief. We seek a plane of rejoicing. Help us, God, to have the demeanor of faith. We pray these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet tonight. With every head bowed, every eye closed as we stand to our feet. The invitation is open. However the Lord has spoken, let's respond to God tonight. However he's spoken tonight.